Good morning. Scott Luton here with you on this edition of This Week in Business History. Welcome to today's show. On this program, which is part of the Supply Chain Now family of programming, we take a look back at the upcoming week, and then we share some of the most relevant events and milestones from years past. Of course, mostly business-focused, with a little dab of global supply chain, and occasionally, we might just throw in a good story outside of our primary realm. So I invite you to join me on this look back in history to identify some of the most significant leaders, companies, innovations, and perhaps lessons learned in our collective business journey. Now, let's dive in to this week in business history. Hello, and thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Scott Luton, and today on this edition of This Week in Business History, we are focused on the week of October 12th. Hey, one quick programming note before we dive into today's show. Big thanks to our listeners in France as this podcast recently hit the Business News Podcast Leadership Charts in that country. In fact, we recently cracked the top 50 for podcasts focused on business news in France. That's wonderful news that we celebrate with you, our listeners. And as always, we invite you to join us by searching for This Week in Business History wherever you get your podcasts. And click to subscribe so you don't miss a single thing. And for that, we are greatly appreciative. Thanks so much for listening. In today's episode, we're focused on the backstory behind one well-known global brand, Weight Watchers. So stay tuned. You might just be surprised with a few aspects of the story behind the brand. Thank you for joining us today on This Week in Business History powered by our team here at Supply Chain Now. Jean Evelyn Slutsky was born on October 12, 1923 in Brooklyn. She was the daughter of a cab driver and a manicurist. Jean Slutsky would drop out of the City College of New York when her father died in 1942. That's when she would begin her professional journey. First, she spent time at Mullen Furniture Company in Jamaica, New York. Eventually, she'd work at the Internal Revenue Service, where she'd meet her first husband, Marty Nidich. Jean and Marty Nidich would spend time in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Warren, Pennsylvania, before settling back in Queens, New York. Specifically, they lived in the Little Neck neighborhood, which is near Little Neck Bay, which is where the term Little Neck Clams originated, by the way which has become a size category for all hard clams regardless of origin. Marty would get a job as an airport driver, and Jean would work raising funds for a variety of charitable groups. But it was her battle with one thing in particular that would change her life, eating. Jean Nadich, in what started in her childhood, was a compulsive eater. In the 1950s, she'd try a variety of solutions to control her weight, including pills, fad diets, even hypnosis. Nadich had one particular food addiction that bedeviled her, Malamars, a chocolate-coated marshmallow cookie. They are delicious. She'd later claim that to hide her addiction to these sweet treats, she'd literally hide a box of the cookies in her clothes hamper, where she'd gorge on them in the middle of the night with no one looking. In 1961, Jean Nadich would take several steps that would help her get a better grasp on her weight. First, she invited six friends over to her home to have a serious and frank conversation. All six of her friends also were struggling in some way with their health and weight. After several hours of exchanging their secret struggles, they all resolved to go on a group diet and support each other through the rigors and temptations that every human has when trying to lose weight. In the ensuing weeks, the group approach began to work. Weight was being shedded right and left, and the group of participants began to swell. Within two months, it grew from seven to more than 40 participants. By October 1962, Jean Nadich hit her target weight of 142 pounds. But just as important, she was determined to really help a ton of other people gain control of their weight and health. One of the couples that were participating in the group weight loss approach was Al and Felice Lippert. Al Lippert was a business leader that was active in the garment industry. He saw a business opportunity in the group's collective success, 
and he suggested to Gene Nidich that he seize the moment. In May 1963, in a loft apartment over a movie theater in that Little Neck neighborhood, Weight Watchers International Incorporated was formed. Gene Nidich would serve as president and chief spokesperson and trainer. Al Lippert would be in charge of the business details, and Felice Lippert would be in charge of recipe development, nutrition, and food research. The model was simple. Gene, Al, and Felice would rent a public venue, and they would charge program attendees $3 per weekly meeting. At the meeting, recipes and ideas would be shared and emotional support offered. The program and recommendations that were offered were based on information found via city obesity clinics. So thumbs up to lean meat, fish, skim milk, fruits, veggies, thumbs down to alcohol, sweets, and fatty foods. Key components to the program were also food journaling, establishing realistic dietary goals, and motivational communication with speakers, books, events, and more. The first official meeting in May 1963 drew 400 attendees. Interestingly enough, the first meeting was held in a venue that sat on top of a pizza joint. The owner of the pizza joint couldn't figure out why folks were lined up outside, but they weren't buying any pizza. Later, Gene Nottich would collaborate with that same pizza joint owner to create a Weight Watchers milkshake that would go on to be a big seller. Blessed be those ties that bind. And in 1964, just months after the first meeting above that pizza joint, a franchise approach was rolled out. Now for a quick sidebar, have you ever heard of the Razor and Blades business model? The model is certainly older than the name, but the name originated with King Camp Gillette. Yes, Gillette as in the huge brand of household goods that is now part of the global Procter & Gamble enterprise. King Camp Gillette is widely credited as saying, quote, give them the razor, sell them the blades. Gillette would sell the razor itself at a very low cost, which would then ensure that the consumers that own the razor would continuously buy the razor blades. So back to Weight Watchers International Incorporated, Jean, Al, and Felice decided to franchise via the Razor and Blades model. Graduates of the Weight Watchers program could pay a very inexpensive franchise fee, which would then allow them to access various aspects of the programming, by which they could lead their own groups in their own hometowns, with only 10% of gross earnings being due to Weight Watchers International Inc. as a royalty. And boy, did it sell like hotcakes. Just three years after rolling out the franchise opportunity, there were 102 franchises internationally. The first Weight Watchers cookbook, which was published in 1966, it sold a whopping 1.5 million copies. By 1968, just some five years after the company had been formed, there were over 1 million Weight Watchers members worldwide. So what next? Weight Watchers International Inc. would go public, which would turn Gene and Marty Nottich and Al and Felice Lippert all into millionaires. And the company would also roll out a variety of prepared foods and other products. By 1973, Gene Nottich wanted to focus more on the PR side of the business, traveling, interviews, keynotes. So she would resign as president. Also in 1973, the company held a huge party at Madison Square Garden to celebrate its 10th anniversary. 16,000 people attended, including Bob Hope and Roberta Peters. It was a who's who of stars and personalities at the time. The company was on the move. And by the late 1970s, Weight Watchers International Inc. would grow into quite the global enterprise, which was becoming tougher and tougher for Al Lippert to manage. So H.J. Hines Company would come calling. The company would acquire Weight Watchers in 1978 for about $72 million. Al Lippert would remain as chairman and CEO at least for a few years, and Gene Nottich would serve as a paid consultant and spokesperson. Weight Watchers would thrive throughout the fitness-crazed 1980s, but things started to change in 1990 as new competitors were making gains. Jenny Craig, Nutrisystem, SlimFast. In 1998, Weight Watchers would introduce its infamous points system where foods were assigned a points value. And two years later, a more personalized version of the points system was introduced. Heinz would sell the organization to a private equity group in 2001. 
the PE firm Artal Luxembourg would take Weight Watchers public again that same year. Later, a website would be launched, and in 2009, Weight Watchers rolled out its first app. All the while, Jean Nottich was still preaching the gospel of Weight Watchers throughout the decades. She'd say, quote, When you're trying to lose weight, one of the most important things you can do is eat three decent meals a day so that you're not so hungry that you can't get your food off your mind. Habit and hunger have long been the basic insidious enemies of the overweight. We can't fight hunger, but we can fight habit, end quote. Jean Nottich, the incredible savvy business leader, founder, and passionate spokesperson would pass away at her home in Parkland, Florida of natural causes on April 29th, 2015. A few months later, Oprah Winfrey would famously invest in Weight Watchers in October 2015, becoming a 10% owner and spokesperson. Also in 2015, Johns Hopkins reviewed thousands of studies on a wide variety of weight loss programs. And that prestigious organization found that the Weight Watchers approach was one of the few that really had a scientific basis. In 2018, Weight Watchers made a shift. Now it's rebranded as WW. The company shifted to a broader message of overall health and wellness. And it came with a new tagline, wellness that works. Now the company is comprised of some 4.6 million members worldwide. And at the heart of WW, you'll find Gene Nottich's strong sense of empathy, tenacity, compassion, zest for life, and immensely strong appreciation for community support. A few other items to note on this week in business history for the week of October 12th. On October 18th, 1648, the Boston Shoemakers formed the first American labor organization. On October 16th, 1758, American teacher and journalist Noah Webster was born in West Hartford, Connecticut. He would also become known for compiling the first American dictionary of the English language. And now, Dictionary Day is celebrated on October 16th each and every year. On October 18th, 1836, Frederick August Otto Schwartz was born in Germany. He would found the company FAO Schwartz in 1862 in Baltimore, Maryland, later opening a location at 745 Fifth Avenue in New York City, where it has operated for 55 years. On October 13, 1872, Leon Leonwood Bean was born in Greenwood, Maine. He'd go on to launch the company L.L. Bean in 1912 in Freeport, Maine. And on October 14, 1964, Martin Luther King Jr. would be recognized with the Nobel Peace Prize for battling racial inequalities through nonviolent means. That wraps up this edition of This Week in Business History. Those were some of the stories that stood out to us, but hey, what do you think? What stands out to you? Tell us about it. Shoot us a note to amanda at supplychainnow.com or find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram and share your comments there. We're here to listen. Thanks so much for listening to our podcast. I hope you've enjoyed our latest edition of This Week in Business History. Hey, be sure to check out a wide variety of industry thought leadership at supplychainnow.com. Friendly reminder, you can find This Week in Business History wherever you get your podcast from and be sure to tell us what you think. We'd love to earn your review. Hey, be sure to check out the entire family of Supply Chain Now programming, including Tequila Sunrise with Greg White, Supply Chain is Boring with Chris Barnes, Tech Talk, Digital Supply Chain Podcast with Corinne Bursa, Veteran Voices, and a lot more. You can search for them wherever you get your podcasts. On behalf of the entire team here at This Week in Business History and Supply Chain Now, hey, this is Scott Luton wishing all of our listeners nothing but the best. Thanks so much for listening. We're grateful for your support. Hey, do good, give forward and be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time here on This Week in Business History. Thanks, everybody.